has a, a very great long-term upside. And so it, it to me, it's a favorite base metal. And even today, I said it, it has a better picture of safety right now uh, than even gold and silver. Welcome to In It to Win It. This is Steve Barton, and thank you for tuning in. We are here with Peter Granich of petergranich.com. Peter's been a portfolio manager, been in the business since the 1980s in Wall Street and investing. Peter, thank you for coming on the show. Yes, it's uh, been a long time, so uh, hopefully I'll still be able to answer your questions. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm sure you will. You've probably forgotten more about investing than I'll ever know, so I uh, I appreciate this. Uh, okay, so if you could just give us a quick 60 seconds on your background, how you got started in the 1980s in investing, and uh, uh, maybe a little bit of your background with uh, uh, hedge fund managing and, and like that. Sure. So without any formal education uh, and losing first money to a penny stock broker, it led me to become a stock broker. I, uh, in less than three years, I was head of investment strategy for a New York Stock Exchange member firm. I made a forecast of a crash. They wanted me to retract it or resign. I chose to do neither. And then the day after the crash, I said that this is 1987, uh, we'd be back at new highs within two years. And that garnished a lot of attention. The Good Morning America interviewed me, called me the Wall Street whiz kid, and I milked that moniker for the next 40 years. So uh, I was a hedge fund manager, portfolio manager, then uh, fell in love with gold in the late 1990s, just before it went under $300, and uh, cost me a, a fairly large sum at that point. A few years later, I got back into it. I can remember being at a PDAC show when we were happy it was above 350 and uh, stayed in and out of it uh, most of the rest of my career, both doing corporate communications and then as an investor. And most recently I went back in because we will probably get to it, but relative to the share prices and relative to the underlying metals, I've never seen mining shares this cheap of a valuation. Doesn't mean they can't get any cheaper, but right now historically it's one of the lowest levels. I like the sound of that. Uh, I also like that that you um, got your start without any formal education. I'm I'm kind of a big believer in that. I'm not a real believer in the universities and overpaying for education, especially in this day and age when you can learn and and almost become an expert in just about anything uh, through the internet. You know, I think you have to be kind of careful that you don't put yourself in an echo chamber. But um, um, I like that a lot. Um, okay, uh, the coming retirement crisis. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna read some stats here and kind of throw you a softball, and and you just run with it. A third of Americans have no retirement savings. We have 33 trillion in hard debt, uh, with interest rates around five percent. That's one and a half to two million just going into interest payments every year. Um, 100 trillion in unfunded liabilities. Credit card debt is at an all time high. Uh, last year, most retirement accounts lost a quarter of what they had. Uh, two thirds of people have to work into their seventies or eighties and 75% of people are working paycheck to paycheck. So we either think alike, or you've been reading my stuff lately. I've been both. reading a lot of your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, you're right. It's, it's kind of scary. It's, uh, it, believe it or not, it, it somewhat depressed me because of how overly concerned I am about the future, just based on what you shared. And there's a lot more logs we can throw on that fire to even cause more concern. But right now, I think a lot of the people, well, I shouldn't say that because I, I coined many of the people that work in the financial service industry, the don't worry, be happy crowd. So they don't look at this. And if they do, they won't speak about it. But Many people know that we have a serious debt crisis. You mentioned it, 30 something trillion dollars, throw a 5% interest rate on there, it's 1.7 trillion in interest payments. You know, we don't double that is about, you know, to what we do in GTP sometimes. So debt crisis is pretty familiar with what people aren't familiar with yet. And those that are all familiar on Wall Street don't want to talk about it because it's such a big livelihood to them handling people's retirement accounts. But we have a retirement crisis. You, you brought it out. 
first of all, three quarters of Americans now, it's up from 60 something percent, but three quarters of Americans now are basically working paycheck to paycheck. They don't even have the ability to have a thousand dollars saved uh, for emergency, let alone any retirement funds. We all know that entitlement issues uh, are gonna have to be addressed because there's just so much owed and there's no money sitting where to pay for them. So we have these people, they're gonna have to work, as you said, well into their 70s or even 80s. Uh, they're gonna look for government assistance, uh, like a, just a natural thing to do at a time when we know the government is indebted up to its ears. And we didn't even mention uh, you know, some of the worst things that the government uh, is, is facing right now, the geopolitical concerns and those things. And, and and the one that no one talks about, Steve, which really has disappeared off the radar at a time when it should be on the radar the most, and that's the potential derivative problem. For years, we've seen a, a multiplying of how many derivatives are out there. And there have been people who have spoken about it that domino falls. You ever watch that show where one domino falls, all the other dominoes fall? But the retirement crisis is a legitimate concern. Uh, I see it. Uh, I see seniors who have come to me and said, Pete, do you know about XYZ company? I go, yeah, well, it's down 20, 25%. And they'll say, well, I'm not concerned about that. I'm concerned if they can keep paying the dividend because I'm living off the dividend. And one last thing, Steve, where there's gonna be also serious issue, most of the Wall Street does what we call traditional financial planning. Our group, we call what we do as an alternative traditional. The traditional financial planning basically has this belief. Market goes up, you take out 4% you, to what you need to live on, it makes it up, the market goes up, and the market just becomes the feeder of your retirement. Well, last year that had a big disruption. So the average, as you noted, retirement count was down 25% according to Fidelity. Throw on a 10 to 15% inflation over at least two years, it's probably more. You've lost a lot of money and purchasing power in your retirement plan, and you don't have the ability to make it up if you are retired unless you go back to work. So the retirement crisis is something that's gonna evolve more and more as time goes on. And the more we neglect it and don't, put it into our planning, the more it's gonna hurt us, especially with those that are underweighted, which most people, as you said, are underweighted in their retirement. Very few people have reached a level where right now you could retire and live off of that. Okay, can you um, outline for our listeners how important this derivative um, uh, problem is, uh, just, just the leverage that's going on there? Well, it's you're right. It's the leverage, but I always like to make it very simple because, as you said, I I was not from the Wharton School of Business, so my words have one or two syllables in them. They don't have these long, drawn out Harvard stuff. But I I believe the simplicity in learning on the job was much better than anything they could teach in school. But if you can just imagine, you ever seen a show where they people have lined up dominoes for like eight hours. And when they do one, it does this beautiful falling all over. Well, that's the derivative situation. If and when we ever have a crisis to where people have struggled paying the derivatives are out there, it, it's kind of like a piece of paper that's been passed around and people bought it and sold it a hundred times. I like to say for people that are older that have gray hair or no hair, I call it the movie that used to be called The Producers, where they purposely make a mo uh, play that's gonna bomb and they sell the, the company like 20 times over. And unfortunately it becomes a hit. Well, that's what we're facing in the derivative market if and when we ever have a crisis which causes derivatives to be, in a sense, dominoes. Okay, okay. Um, and uh, can you go into your <clears throat> uh, battle of the ages speech? So so basically, you know, the uh, the pension funds, the Social Security and Medicare, the, 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 uh, the battle that's going to take place and I think it's already starting to, in, on a lesser degree, between seniors and, and young folks. You're right. The first battle, of course, has been underway for a while now, and that's the battle of the classes. The middle uh, middle class has basically been shrunk. Few made it to the upper ladder, but most have fallen lower. But the other battle that's coming, and it's tied into the retirement crisis, is going to be the battle of the ages. So over the next few years, there's only two ways for the government to raise funds, cut spending, which they're not good at, or raise taxes, which they're very good at. So the likelihood is 
taxes are going to be raised a lot. So younger people still early in their life working are going to likely see the biggest burden of that. And someday they're going to say, Whoa, wait a second. You're, you're letting this person 80 something years old, who's on Medicare and has been collecting for years. And I'm probably never going to see it. And they're going to have an operation that's going to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I got to pay for it. Let them die. I mean, it's cruel what I just said, but trust me, we're going to get to that point where there's going to be decision. And that 85 year old guy is going to, or gal is going to say, wait a minute, you took out of me all these years. This is what was supposed to be waiting for me. And I, I want to have what I have. And there'll be a political battle because politicians will make a decision and people say, nah, that's never going to happen. Well, I said, you know what I say to Americans? Just look north of the border. Canada instituted a law a couple of years ago now that their health associations actually encourage older people, maybe sick or terminal or just at the point where they, they've lost a sense of living, to, to openly suggest taking their own lives in order to not have to go through the expense and the pain of living in that lifestyle. And if there's any country that's close to us, that similar how we live and have similar thoughts and all, it's Canada. And when people say it can't happen here, well, we already have 10 states where you can basically have assisted suicide now. So that's going to be the battle of the ages that's going to come. Now, it's not going to be tomorrow. But if you're planning out the next five or 10 years, which most people should, you better start taking that into one of the potential social, political, and economic factors that's going to impact the way we live and what's ever happening in the United States at that time. Yeah, that's um, that's pretty true. I, I, I felt that for the first time when um, Canada um, stopped the imports uh, for lumber. You know, in America, we get 80 or 90 percent of our lumber from Canada. And if you didn't have a, uh, a shot, the truckers couldn't cross the border. And now all of a sudden it cost me $14 for a crooked two by four when a straight one used to be three. And um, if there's a, a country that I think could be a, a most comparable to the United States, it's definitely Canada. Well, I, I just put up today and I said, it's the only two countries that if we made a trade for our leaders, we both think we got the short end of the stick. So. <laughs> so true. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, so basically to sum it up, uh, the battle of the ages is going to come down to uh, whoever has the most political influence to influence the politicians to the either, making. Uh, extend the life of, uh, of social security or, or, or not. Yeah. I, one of the things that has to happen with social security is, is they're going to, they're going to say that they're going to just, kick out the billionaires, but there's not that many to kick out of the system. They're going to really have to get down to people earning or maybe have a wealth of just a few million dollars and maybe eliminate it from them. Cause that's where the bulk of the people other than the working class would be. That's going to be the first thing they target. They're going to raise the age to receive it. They're going to tax us more. And so uh, it never was a system that was supposed to be totally depended on. Uh, people always ask, well, why did they ever make it 65? Well, back when it was first formed, living past 65 was unusual. I and mean, then the average age was less than that. And no one thought about that, you know, as we got older and all that money that has been taken out has been long ago spent. It's not sitting anywhere ready to pay people. And so, uh, they'll kick the can one more. Steve, they got another kick in it. They'll They'll use this debt crisis to come up with something marginal. But a few years from now, they're going to have to do serious cutting in not only Social Security, but Medicare and Medicaid, because it's it's just unsustainable at the growth rate it has. And let me add one other thing, which is important. The CBO, which is the closest thing to an independent group around the government, says that based on all of that, we're going to have another $19 trillion added on to our national debt. Now that really becomes unsustainable at that point in time. So it's, it's not a pretty picture coming and it's not going to get better anytime soon. Okay. And by the way, Steve, there's no money in speaking like this, unless you sell cabins in the woods, guns and ammo and dry food, which I know my planning group does not benefit from me taking this approach, but it's what I foresee. And, you know, I, this is what I feel we have to prepare for. Yeah. Um, okay. That's the forecast. I see the same thing you do. Um, what uh, what can a guy do? What what can a person do? What can a senior do? What can a young guy do? Uh, uh, knowing that this is the future, 
the younger person has a better advantage to take advantage of a model that I believe we need to live under. I changed to this. I wasn't this way originally, but I changed to a less is more attitude. You know, when we look around, Steve, our parents and grandparents, they never needed public storage, but you drive down any major road in America, every couple of miles is a public storage facility. And people are storing stuff there that they're not storing in their three, 4,000 or 5,000 square foot home, which our parents and grandparents never had either. So too much stuff and a less is more attitude. Seven out of 10 people that walk into our planning group at all levels of income, they live at least one lifestyle above where their finances really support. And the way they do that is through the debt, you know, and, and borrowing from the future. And now a lot of that's all come back to home to roost, but a less is more attitude is the first. If you retired, it's really troublesome now because most of the people that retired went into these net worth planning people and they would take a past product and hope it would continue to perform well and they could reach their goal and all and buried in the disclaimer is basically they're out, which says past performance doesn't guarantee future results. People learned that after the one-way street turned into a two-way street last year. So older retiree people have much more of a struggle in this retirement crisis than people that still have a lot of years ahead to work. Yeah, I uh, I just helped a friend review his financials and uh, looking over his uh, balance sheet uh, income versus expenses, his expenses were more monthly than, than his income. And uh, one that was blatantly obvious right out of the gate was his $1,000 a month uh, truck payment. And the, uh, I'm doing air quotes here, equity that he has in his truck, he could sell it and literally buy another truck, a used one, and not have a payment, you know, that he could accomplish that over a long weekend, you know, it, um, um, but uh, you, you mentioned the net worth uh, calculator. That kind of brings me to another point. Um, I, uh, I became a millionaire a few years ago and I, ironically, after it happened, I didn't feel any richer. And then I came across a, a quote from Robert Kiyosaki, where he said, net worth doesn't matter. Cash flow does, mm -hmm. you know, if you're worth a hundred mil, but you're only bringing in five grand a month, that doesn't really do anything for you. But if you're worth one mil and you're bringing in 10 grand a month, that's far better. Well, he honored me by bringing me back. I was on over a year ago and I just did it most recently. And one of the things he emphasizes is because our group and I write about it in my book and all is that cash flow is far more important than network. If you talk to any business owner, any real estate developer, it all matters small business size. How you managed your cash flow was a decision maker whether you were successful or not. And most people are trained, especially from the financial commercials, that somehow if you get more money, it'll equal more happiness. And we happen to have the special black box that gets you there. When realistically, a lot of people, and the more that they have, Steve, the more inadequacies they have in the efficiency of what they own. A lot of times when people come in, they'll, they'll, they'll have some real estate, they might even be a small business owner. And so they have an accountant, they have a, 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 an investor, they have a banker, they have a lawyer, and a lot of them never even coordinate together. So efficiency usually comes from cash flow. Show me somebody that's very efficient in cash flow. Uh, you'll find somebody successful. That's one of the reasons why seven out of 10 restaurants fail because people aren't able to sustain positive cash flow. And so we think it's better to just get your Chevy running to a maximum level than trying to take a shot with some crazy investments to turn your Chevy into a Rolls Royce. And uh, most people turn the Rolls Royce back into a Chevy. So we lose some people in that. The younger they are, the less interest they hear. They're, they're still trying to multiply their money. But older people, once they get to a certain level, they realize that efficiency and cash flow is even more important than chasing the net worth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that was an important lesson for me. Um, okay, uh, let's move on to uh, um, investments here. Uh, stock market. How do you feel about the general market uh, uh, in the coming? Uh... So at the by the end of. 2021, it was my suggestion to people to be completely out of stocks and bonds, which shocked a lot of people, the bond situation. But I felt that the transitory talk of inflation at that time was not true. Once inflation's out of the, the bottle, the genie's very hard to put back in. So stocks and bonds, general equities and bonds, I still don't favor. 
only today, as just before you and I spoke, I mentioned now that since one and two year papers up at 5%, it's strong competition, especially when the S and P 500 dividend yields only one and a half percent. So maybe it's time to start going back in on the short term end, but uh, I still don't see any reason uh, to have large exposure to general equities. And, and let, let me just give you two quick reasons, which led me to that decision. And I still believe are valid. One is the age or the experience of the typical financial advisor out there was basically 10 years or less. So they really only had possibly one experience if they were back at 2000 of a declining market. They basically learned and have been driving on a one-way street with free gas from the Federal Reserve, put the pedal to the metal, and that's what they knew, okay? And then, of course, I said that they're gonna hit a two-way street or worse, a traffic circle. Because I don't know if you remember the first time you got to a traffic circle, I did. I was scared because there was traffic coming from different directions. That's what's happened now. So the inexperience of people knowing what a two-way market can be is going to hurt because they don't know what to do. Now, I coined that group, the don't worry, be happy crowd. I, I say this all the time, and I got to say it to you because you've been in-depth in allowing me to speak here. You can toss most of them off the top of the ain't by state building, and all the way down, they'll all say the same thing. Hey, so far, so good. And that's the attitude now. It's always going to come back. That's what people who are deer in the headlights now that have not made any changes but still have spoken to me all tell me that they say we're hoping or my advisor says it should come back. And I'll just say this, Steve, hope is the best spiritual strategy, but it's the worst investment strategy. You have to have something a lot more than hope to justify it. Th that is a key reason. And then the other reason is, is that the Federal Reserve has learned its lesson. It's, it's they even, as we spoke today, even though markets and gold was getting crushed, he basically said that we're just not ever going to see zero interest rates again, which by the way, they killed the fixed income market, which people used to be able to switch out of stocks if you bearish it and get a return. It, it's just very hard to see how stocks can perform in the same manner as they did the last 10 or 20 years. So I think they're going to be underperforming. And the problem with that is a lot of people, and again, going back to retirement and everything, have made very, <clears throat> excuse me, very large bets on the stock market. And I think there's going to be trouble for that. Yeah, I see the same thing. Um, okay. Uh, let's move on to gold. That was the inspiration for my background here. I know you're a big uh, uh, precious metals uh, bull. Um, Base case for gold, inflation by the government's own admission is 6%. We, if we follow John Williams, it's it's north of uh, uh, 12, while the, the 10 years paying about 4%. So that math is terrible. Uh, over the last three or four decades, the average investment uh, uh, portfolio held, um, I'm sorry, about 1.5% of uh, Americans had some investable assets into uh, precious metals. Now that's less than one half of 1%. Um, if inflation continues to persist, which is likely, I believe, uh, people begin to become concerned about the purchasing power of their money. And historically, when that happens, they move into precious metals. And um, do you see any other main catalysts to this market or, or what? Uh, what's your base case for gold? Well, I was batting a thousand if we could have stopped the interview before talking about gold, because as we speak, it's getting really hit hard today and it's down from its most recent highs. I I'm adamant that this has been the beginning of a new mega bull market, which I believe will end up being the best bull market gold's ever had in its days of free trading. People aren't going to feel that at the moment today, but I don't believe today has changed anything for the longer term. So the argument for gold is a lot of things. One, you made a very good point. People are very undivested in it. I don't even think it's a half of 1%. I think we'd be very hard to go into any financial service firm, look at their clients' accounts, and find any measurable things related to gold. Just not in the U.S. at least. Some other countries, people more adapt to owning gold. The other thing that I think has been really critical and underlines my support, why I wouldn't change any thoughts today, even though we're down, is the tremendous buy-in by central banks. I mean, the, if you were around when I was, when they were terrible sellers and really, really kept the price down, they have been buyers unlike any other time in history. 
Now, they're not buying it for a trade, Steve. They're not buying to speculate on it. They're buying for a very important reason that they foresee something or many things coming. A, just to diversify away from the U.S. dollar, whether it's geopolitical reasons or monetary or combination of both. Perhaps prepare for the inevitable uh, change of the U.S. dollar being the reserve currency or at least a competitor coming out. Or we know already certain countries are trading with each other, not using the dollar. But to see that amount of buy-in uh, suggests to me that they're at least speculating on something significant that you'd want to own gold for. So uh, I'm going to share kinda... my screen here real quick, and you can see the graph. This goes back to 1950. And uh, here, uh, they were net sellers until about 2010. And since then, I mean, their gold purchases from 2001 to 2022 have more than doubled. Yeah, so Steve, that is a very point, and that's my underlining most important point. I think there's another point, although I'm certain there'll be people on the internet today disagreeing with this, but the days of gold being heavily manipulated with phantom sell orders and all the other stuff that was out there, they're behind us. It's not to say it's not gonna still happen, but because the trading that was solely used to be in London and at the Crimex, people call it the Comex, I always called it the Crimex, that has moved to the Far East. So as more and more trading over there, we're seeing less and less of that. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen. And there's certain people that every time it's down 20 something, they're gonna blame manipulation other than just hardcore selling. But that has been a significant part. The physical market is becoming a more importance, which it should be. It was always crazy to hear that gold got clobbered $40 one day and gold bullion deals were telling you everybody was calling up to buy it. We don't understand that. But those are two important reasons. Then there's a whole other a host of reasons to own not only that, but silver and, and base metals. Because if you're going to buy into this whole electrification of, of the world and so forth and so on, you need base metals that aren't readily available. And also, you know, I know you told me where you live, but a lot of states have been having brownouts and blackouts. Oh, yeah, and that's based, on, that's based on current electrical uses. Now, if everybody's switching over to electric cars and electric this, the grid system is so old and in a, incapable of taking on much more capacity. I like the joke that Thomas Edison installed some of it. So there's a lot of things that need to be done if the electrification argument's gonna come, but one of the big things is the under, uh, under ownership of the needed minerals. And let me just make one other point there. When you looked at mining 20 or 30 years ago, you could spin a globe, just let your finger hit a country and go, yeah, we can go there. Can't do that anymore. There's a lot of things happening in, 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 that are impacting miners negatively in areas of the world now that were once very, very popular to look for minerals. Social unrest, political unrest. We just saw a country tell a mining company, hey, no more 2% royalty, 20% royalty. If you don't like it, hit the road. So what was that, Panama? Panama. Okay. And so these things are playing a role into the metals, but not to the level of the central bank buying. So yeah, we have a rough day as you and I speak, but I'm not too concerned. I still think there's hundreds and hundreds of dollars to the upside and maybe 50 or a hundred dollars risk to the downside. And as long as the risk reward looks like that to me, I stay with it being favorable. Right on. Um, okay. You talked about the electrification. That is so true. I am experiencing that firsthand. Uh, when we were having, um, uh, it was during the summer, uh, they, on one hand, told us uh, that, that we're going to move to electrical EV cars. And then the very next day, everyone got a text message saying, do not charge your cars from the hours of 5 to 9 p.m. I'm like, during rolling brownout, brownouts, you know, the left hand isn't talking to the right. Um, what is your copper uh, uh, stance? How do you feel about copper? Well, it's my favorite base metal. The lithium, the lithium market has moved to the point where there still be some upside, but it's moved so much and so many people are at it. It's almost at the stage where if you were in very early, you have to come a seller in that environment. That that metal has moved, but the copper hasn't to the level that I think it can still go to. And I think it has a 
extremely bullish fundamentals because the difficulty, as we just spoke about, in areas of the world where we used to go is much harder. And one of the things that's also happened in mining, Steve, for a lot of years, is it's been undercapitalized, meaning companies haven't performed well, they haven't thrown a lot of money at expiration. And even if a lot of money this tomorrow came into it, it doesn't happen overnight. It takes a lot of years to find, develop, and deliver minerals. So it has uh, an extremely tight supply scenario. The, the numbers and analysts suggest of how much more demand is going to be if we're going to go this electrification route, which it looks like most of the Western world has gone full steam ahead in. Uh, copper has a, a very great long-term upside. And so it, it to me, it's a favorite base metal. And even today, I said it, it has a better picture of safety right now uh, than even gold and silver. Not by much, but it, it, it really is be very hard to see it fall dramatically even though everybody would say, well, the economy is going to get weak, copper is a barometer for the economy. It normally is. But in this particular case, there's so limited supplies right now. Uh, and and mining, mining companies are going to have to think twice where they're going to go before you know, they can readily deliver supply. OK, we are way in, under invested in copper. Uh, OK, how, how would you play this? Um, uh, the COPX, the copper miner ETF, maybe? Uh, uh... Yeah, I think I'm sorry Steve, to interrupt. Uh, yeah, I think for most people, unless you're very sophisticated to, to, to judge individual stocks or you found someone that has a long history, not the most recent history like the crypto people were, yeah. uh, they were selling, you know, we had 21 year old. 22-year-old kids on CNBC telling us, you know, they made millions, going to go millions. And I used to say their biggest tough economic problem was trying to figure out algebra class a few years ago in high school. So, uh, but if you can find somebody that has a long history and, and mining the, the junior resource business, if I may just say this, I have two golden rules, which I broke last year, which cost me dearly. The first is to accept that failure is the norm. Every 10 companies that go looking for a metal can all be honest, can all work hard, but one or two are only going to go the whole nine yards, find, develop, sell, or develop that mine. The other rule is not only do you have to be financially prepared to lose part of your capital, but you have to be mentally prepared. And most financial advisors, some are very good in judging whether people's financial risk tolerance is okay, but very few can appreciate the mental anguish you go through if you do lose money. And uh, I suffered uh, from that. Now, you would think when you listen or hear some of these conferences, none of these guys and gals ever lose money, but they do. And uh, so I think it, for the copper, for your answer is, unless you're very, very good at selecting individual stocks, that's what ETFs and mutual funds are best for. And and, and I think that would be the better route for most people. Okay. okay. The CLPX. What, uh, how do you feel about, um, we're in BHP. What, what, how do you feel about Freeport, Glencore, Ivanhoe? I think the majors, from what I looked at, are in much better shape in this cycle than they were in previous cycles. By now, they were heavily indebted. They were buying it. They were paying top dollar to take over you know, companies that ran up a lot because they made a major discovery and all. That's not the case right now for them. They've got a lot of good cash on hand, free cash flow. The juniors are just so beaten down and it's, it, they won't have to pay much over current prices in order to acquire them. So I'm I'm expecting a, a significant increase in M&A. So the companies that you mentioned, without specifically looking at them, I would suspect a year from now, you'll look back and see that they made multiple acquisitions to take advantage of price levels versus what we just talked about, a still bright future for base metals. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Sprott just came up with a um, junior copper miner ETF, uh, the COPJ. So that, that might be a, a way to... For the average, well, Sprott guy. has Sprott has excuse me, Sprott has a history of being one of the early ones when a play turned. They did it with uranium, something that still has a ways to go, but not as fast like rocket ships that people spend time on the internet sending up. But Sprott many times, especially in the commodities end, gets in early. And if they had that, I'm certain the juniors are, are very depressed, and that'll be the time that you would want to look at something like that. Um, all right. You just talked about it. Uranium. That was my next question. Uh, I feel like there's this uh, 
what's the what's the word? Uh, okay, the, the, there's a YouTube crowd and, and Twitter crowd that is just completely thinking that uranium is going to double over a long weekend. And um, I, I just got into this uh, maybe a year, year and a half ago. Uh, we're up 10%. That seems pretty good to me. Uh, what's your time frame on this? How, how do you feel about uh, uranium? So I was never in uranium, but I was okay. listening to a interview of a gentleman a few years back, one who I know that writes a newsletter that one of the few that I read. And he noted about uranium and he said uranium was down like at 16. I said, what? I remember years ago when it was 100 and something and that was all everybody was talking about. And there might have been 400 juniors at that point in time claiming they had looking for uranium. So I got involved, but I decided to take a more cautious and more prudent for me anyway. And I said, you know, there's so few producers that if we're right about this turning up and getting back to 40 or $50 or higher, how could this company not do well? And that's Camago. So I went heavily into Camago versus trying to find a junior or something. And I still think that's the proper way for most people. you got to start with the bellwether. Uh, but like you, and I talked about it for a couple months now, because everybody's on Twitter, even I went back to Twitter in late December. And the more you talk about something, if you talk about it six times a day and you keep reading that six times a day, after a week, you're going to be disappointed if it isn't up because you heard so much about it, yet it's not up. When the old days, the only time we would know what the price was doing if we called our broker or got the newspaper the next day. And that kept us from being too short-term oriented. The other thing also that plays a role in that is discounted commissions. Some of these people trade these things now for a few pennies, which you couldn't have done when it would have cost you three, $400 commission 10 or 20 years ago. But you're right. There's too much short-term. I get people still when I say, I think $75 is the target. Are you kidding me? It's going to 200. You know, I said, let it get to 75. We'll all make money. And then we'll see if there's a shot at 200. And so we've had disappointment. With only it going sideways, it's not like it went down a lot. But the fact that it, the rocket ships didn't work, people become short-term oriented. And it's an amazing thing that I also watch, Steve. On the up days, everybody uses a rocket or something. And on the down days, they have some men where they're getting killed because they bought uranium. And again, that's too much looking at something short-term. And that's why that market, like you said, if you could make 10 or 20%, you should be happy with that. Yeah, I thought that was a pretty good return. Uh, we'll we'll see how this irons out over the next few years, but I'm looking at uh, at least that one as a three to five year bet. Um, I don't know. Maybe the I'm wrong. fundamentals we didn't discuss. Let me just send sixty seconds. Twenty years ago, if you went to a senator of any state and said, "Hey, I want to build a nuclear plant," no way. We'll never see nuclear again. Now that same senator, please, would you build one so I can fix my electrical problem for my constituents? Nuclear energy, <clears throat> excuse me, has made a 180 degree turn from very unfavorable to the favorable. And if you're going to believe in electrification and all that stuff, solar power and windmills are not going to be the complete answer. You're going to need nuclear energy to play an important role in that. I agree. I agree. We're living that firsthand here in California. Um, okay, real quick. How do you feel about oil? Well, if I'm an oil company and I see when we were up the lambasting that they got from this administration, <clears throat> which if you think about it, the previous administration actually got us to energy self-sufficient. We were actually at a point where I don't remember the last time that existed, that we were exporting energy. And now we've seen a reversal in that. And we've seen a big drawdown on our strategic reserves, not for the reason that that reserve was created for in the first place. So now, if you're a major oil company and everybody's talking about this electrification and anytime oil went up, they called you the bad person. Why are you going to throw a lot of money to find new reserves? Yeah. I, I, can't, I can't imagine there would be a reason for that. So even though the economy slowed now and likely to stay slow, that's why it's down. If and when economies around the world pick up again, oil's only going up because they're not going to, it's still going to be a great need for, for several years to come. And there's just not a lot, no reason to go out and spend a lot of new money chasing it. So 
you know, you pick a number. I don't watch it every day, Steve, but somewhere, you know, may, maybe if there's such a bad recession, it trades down to 50 or 55. But can it be above 100 again? Absolutely. Yeah, I I, uh, I remember seeing a graphic. I don't have it now, but uh, it was um, uh, oil consumption during the uh, the right in the middle of uh, COVID. And it really didn't go down that much. It's it's like there's a there's a baseline, uh, you know, uh, if it were energy, it would be a base load power. Uh, but there's there's a, a minimum amount that kind of needs to be consumed, uh, kind of regardless, you know. Um, so, yeah, we, we got into oil when it was almost free right after uh, the COVID crash. And um, I've been looking for an opportunity like that again in oil, and I don't know that it's going to come. But uh, I don't think we'll ever get to that minus or whatever it was because we yeah, minus 30 back bucks then. a barrel <laughs> but uh i do think uh you cannot expect any major or minor oil company to throw a lot of money to look for brand new spend heavily on expiration at this point in time and one of the things i thought would happen but the share prices have come off i thought if the share prices stay up we start to see them diversify and i felt but now Canada's even into no law. I started to think that Camago would have been a good target for an energy company. But Canada's just introduced a bill now, mostly targeted at the Chinese, but to keep more control of, of foreigners buying into their mining companies and all. But uh, I, I still think the, ma the major mining companies uh, are going to have to try to diversify into something else other than pure oil, because like it or not, whether it works or not, Governments have put the pedal to the metal on this electrification and, you know, uh, electric cars and so forth and so on, which I still can't, I, I still can't see it. If we don't fix our grid here in America, we're not going to be able to get the power we're all going to need. So I think they put the cart before the horse, but we'll see over the next couple of years if I was right or not. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Okay, uh, Peter, this has been awesome. Thank you for coming on the show. If people want to get a hold of you, go to petergranich.com. There'll be a link in the show notes. Is there anything else you want to uh, end with? Well, I'm on Twitter. I try to answer questions there. Uh, it's at Peter Granich. I'm in the twilight of my career, like I said, in our financial planning group. Uh, we did the right thing, but most people are deer in the headlights now. And I would just say that if anything... You need to err on the side of caution now. You know, let something happen and happy days are right. And the don't worry, be happy crowd are right. And they come back with the Kool-Aid and all that stuff. But until that's evident, I think you really have to be cautious. And uh, less is more is a way to live. And unfortunately, we don't need all the things that the world tells us we need. Focus on having the necessities. And if and when you can afford a luxury too, then so you brought up about the person with a, the car loans, you know, and uh, you just want the car to get to where you want to get, or do you want to spend a thousand extra a month just so you can say, look what's in my driveway. And that's one of the things I think we got to learn to change as well. To live with less. I like that a lot. Well said, sir. All right. PeterGranish.com. Thank you again, sir. This has been a lot of fun and you have a great rest of the day. You too, Steve. God bless.